Good morning, everybody. Welcome along to this morning's AGP webinar. Uh, thanks for taking your time to attend. For those who have been on many of these, I apologise for the next two minutes, but it has to be done for housekeeping rules. I'm Lisa from the AGP Office Administration team, just here to help facilitate alongside Leslie Rossiter this morning. I'll pass you over to Leslie in a moment. But just before I do, if we can just go through a few housekeeping rules. Please, can you ensure your microphone is on mute during the presentation just to avoid any interference or background noise or any children coming to ask for biscuits or in my son's case, asking for £50 for V-Bucks? There will be a question and answer session later on in the webinar. Um, obviously, then you can come off your mics to ask those questions there. There's not many on this morning, so that would be an easy one to follow there. If you prefer to ask your questions through the chat facility, that's fine. I'll be here just monitoring there, and then Leslie can go through as many of those questions as possible at the end. If you need any help or support, I'll be here monitoring. So any problems, please just ask. Just to make you aware, we are being recorded this morning just to help us collect any questions or comments being missed during the webinar. If you have any questions or concerns about this, please let me know. Following on from the webinar, you'll receive two emails from me. Uh, we will require you, if you're an AGP client, we will require you to sign a digital registration form for the Welsh Government. This will be an AG3. We'll come through via our Hello um, Sign e-signature platform with a link. Really easy to follow, takes less than a minute, and we do need those so that we can confirm to Welsh Government that the webinar took place and how many people attended. So please, can you get those signed and sent back to me as soon as possible? You'll also receive an email with a link to two surveys to provide feedback to us. Again, this is a really big help. So if you could do those, that would be fab. On that note, I shall hand you over to Leslie. So over to you, Leslie. Okay, so hello everybody and thank you. And um, I'm, I think a couple of you may have joined um, an earlier webinars that um, I did earlier on in, I think it was back in March, just kind of around the beginning of lockdown. Um, so, as, as um, Lisa said, some of you have attended some web, some of the webinars before, and I know that there have been lots of them. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch off my camera because I find myself watching myself quite distracting. So um, it helps me if I can't look at myself. Um, but what we're here for today is to look at um, life after lockdown, um, kind of help try to manage how you can. Um, uh, what your the changes to your work staff um, may be. So the contents of the webinar are looking at the furlough scheme for those of you that have got staff furloughed. Um, what kind of the next few months might look like. I'm sure you've started to have a look at this, but hopefully I can give you some extra help in terms of looking at options that you might not have thought of. Um, how to survey your staff if you're either not in contact with them regularly or um, just to kind of get a, a, some quest, useful questions to ask, to get a feel for, um, understanding the capacity that you might have to help you with that planning exercise over the next few months. Um, and thinking about understanding the basics of change in terms of conditions, so contract variations, um, and managing redundancy consultation exercises. And I did cover redundancy off in an earlier webinar back in March. Um, but what I'm going to do with this one is I've framed it a little bit differently, focusing quite a bit on different pitfalls when you're going through the process, um, just to think about that aren't really covered on some of the ACAS guidance and things like that. So just little things to think about that people don't always give enough attention to detail to. Um, and again, best practice, uh, just so you get a good feel for that. Um, and then just a little bit at the end about staff well-being, because it all kind of wraps up together, really. A lot of this is about um, consultation and engagement with staff. Um, so some thoughts about um, staff well-being. So it's broken up into the five, um, into the five sections, as you can see. Um, and I will say at the end, if you need any further support following the webinar, um, there are, I have got a few um, half an hour slots available if people feel that they need something a bit more specific to their situation, um, then I'll cover that off um, towards the end. So the main changes to the furlough scheme, as you'll be aware, um, I mean, I guess the principle of what the government is trying to achieve is fairly simple. Um, from July, employees will be able to work part time or be in furlough for hours that they don't work. And you just pay the normal pay for the hours that you use from August. 
um, sorry, from August, then um, your employers will need to start contributing towards wage costs. And that goes up then to a maximum of 20% um, if, you're, um, if you're not topping up to the 100% by October. Um, and that's whether or not employees are working. So from July, um, employees, as I say, can work part-time, be furloughed part-time. From August, you've got to contribute NI and pension. From September, you're contributing a 10% or more. And from October, you're contributing 20% or more. I'm sure you're already aware of that. From July then, so this is the last month really, you can fully utilize furlough pay without it costing you anything. Um, you can use this time to plan for the impact of phasing out furlough um, and or for when it ends. So what you can think about doing is instructing staff to take accrued annual leave. Um, if you haven't already done this, then you can be telling staff, as long as you give them double the length of notice to the leave that they need to take. So if they need to take a week's leave, you tell them two weeks in advance, I'm expecting you to take that week as leave. Um, then, and you need to remember to top up their pay to 100%. Um, so again, this is an opportunity to use the time while staff are furloughed and that most of that salary is being covered um, to just top up for annual leave and it means then when they come back to work that hopefully they haven't got lots of accrued leave that they then want to take when hopefully the business starts um, operating more, more um, with more clients than perhaps it has been over the last few months. Um, and you can bring some employees back to work part time in July um, to assist with this could might be a system with preparations to start back up again or to start um, when business starts to get more busy. Um, but you also need to remember if you can't bring everyone back you need to think about making sure you're following a fair process rather than just picking and choosing who you think should come back um, so maybe start by asking for volunteers and we'll come onto the staff survey that will hopefully help you start planning based on your capacity um, in the next section and you can use July um, to start a consultation process. So if you are looking at contract variations, if you are restructuring or planning redundancies, then July now is a good time to be doing that and utilising the full pay that you've still got in furlough um, to undertake that consultation process. And it's a common um, misunderstanding in furlough that because staff are furloughed that they can't be involved in any work at all. I mean, they can still communicate with them and you should be, and they should still be having contact with you. Um, and that's from a wellbeing perspective as much as anything, but you can, they can um, join a consultation process without it being classed as work. Um, so if you're looking at making redundancies for more than 20 employees, because your consultation period needs to be 30 days, or maybe 45 if it was even over 99 employees, you would, if you had an employee with long service, um, 12 weeks, then add all of that together and you're through up to the end of the, fur end of the furlough period. So really, if you've got those longer standing members of staff and you're looking at big numbers of redundancy, then you should be, if you want to get the best out of um, using furlough for the process, then July is when you need to need to start really. Um, another option I've identified that again people haven't necessarily thought about taking up is putting staff on mandatory training or much needed training that perhaps they haven't had capacity to do previously if that's available online um, or there's a way of the training is being delivered in a socially distance which I know some training providers are starting back up again. Um, so it's about minimising disruption to the company and again, it's only then costing you to top up those training days or those training hours to 100% of pay. Um, or, of course, you can, your options are you just keep staff furloughed for July um, and there's no cost to the company to do that. Moving on to August, again, so you'll see a common theme. There's the, lots of these are the same. They just change slightly because of the way that the furlough scheme is being tapered off. So if you haven't, you've still got the opportunity to instruct your staff to take leave. Um, you might want to consider now whether you're bringing staff back part time because there's now a cost to the business of having those staff, albeit it's a fairly small cost, um, but you might want to utilise them or think about something they can do from home if you can't 
bring them back to the workplace yet. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, if you're thinking about those changes, the consultation process, then it gives, this gives you less time if you're starting in August. But if you've got shorter service members of staff, or you're, you've got less than 20 redundancies, you can still, or less than 20 contract changes, you can still um, get your consultation process done and dusted before um, furlough comes to an end. Um, and again, a reminder about putting staff on training or keeping staff furloughed for the month. So moving to September, um, again, the options are the same. Um, but again, you're, if you're looking at a redundancy exercise, you're in, in order to be able to utilise furlough more fully, you are now, <clears throat> sorry, you're now, you've now got less time effectively to go through a consultation process, give people notice, have them work their notice and potentially not come back to work before furlough ends, if that's something that you think um, you, that might need to happen. Um, and again, it's about minimising disruption to the business and it's about looking um, at how much is it costing you to go through the process. So in September, you've got, you've got to at least top up 10% of salary and pay NI and pension. Um, so there is going to be a cost um, to any of that work that is undertaken in September. Um, and of course, it gets uh, more expensive again when you get towards October, because now you're having to top up a minimum of 20% of salary. So again, if you haven't then already done that, you can look at instructing staff to take leave. You can look again at whether you um, have staff working part time, whether you and once you've done your survey, hopefully you'll have a better idea who's going to be available. You might want to be bringing people back part time um, across the board. Everybody comes back to do a few hours or because of certain people's circumstances. Um, they can do more hours and others can do less. And um, so it's, it's kind of planning ahead and thinking about what's going to be the best thing for your business. And when we come to the survey, we'll talk about um, how you can try and balance that with the, the best, the needs of your staff as well. So the thing you do need to remember when you're now thinking about phasing in these changes is if you have staff that are furloughed and you've previously written to them to say, we're going to furlough you, this is what furlough looks like, furlough's now going to start changing potentially. So what you need to remember to do is to um, send out new letters to them, get them to sign preferably somewhere in the correspondence to say that they agree. So if you're saying we want you to come back part time, um, then you, you want to be out, outlining the expectation of when they'll be due to come back, the hours that you're expecting them to work, give them notice, um, but make sure that it, it can, it's spelt out in writing. Um, maybe if it's for a temporary period, what the review date for that would be. And obviously I would expect that to be at the latest, the end of October, because from October, there's not obviously not going to be, we're not expecting that there's likely to be an extension to furlough. So um, you, you planning ahead, you want to make sure you get that review date in there. So, um, I mean, again, as I said, the survey that we're going to come on to next is um, what's going to be most helpful perhaps to you then. Um, so these are the um, areas that we're, I'm going to cover off talking about the survey. And the main purpose of the survey, and I've, I've used this already with a few organisations who've got staff on furlough, so I'm already kind of understanding how well it's working, um, is it's about giving uh, you an opportunity to check in with staff. I'm sure you're doing it anyway, um, but at least to make sure that you've got kind of documentation to show that you're checking in as well. Um, see how they're doing, what their personal situations are over the next few months and how this impacts on their ability in effect to fulfill the contract that they've got with you. So we're fully anticipating employment tribunals are going to expect employers to be sensitive and thoughtful about the unprecedented situation that everybody's in at the moment. Um, obviously, we, you, we never know until case law starts to um, shape these things, um, what that's going to look like. But, but I would say always have that in the back of your mind. 
Um, and again, I think the survey um, serves that purpose to a degree as well, that you're showing you're thinking ahead about your staff needs and not just the business needs. So when looking at um, the group that are potentially shielding at the moment, so this is individuals who've been specifically advised by the government to shield, um, but they can work from home if they can do their work from home, of course. Um, but if they've been furloughed because there isn't work for them to do, but now there is work for them to do, then you need to think about whether you can provide some of that work from home. Um, and if not, then they're still entitled to shield until the arrangements are reviewed in the middle of August. So for this period, those um, staff can remain furloughed um, unless you could put in place, because of the nature of your business, you could put in place um, adjustments such that perhaps they could come to work and it would be as much um, of a risk as it is being in that within their own homes. Um, so, um, and again, what I would say is this is again, this period of thinking about they're going to stay furloughed, but maybe I might want them to use up some of their leave during this period because other people are coming back to work and I don't want, I want them to be available once shielding um, of guidance, once they're not shielding anymore. Or again, do they need to undertake some training before they come back? This is a great time to get them to, to those staff to be doing that. Now we're obviously anticipating based on, on what England has done already, that from the 17th of August, following the review, those who've been advised to shield can return to normal, the new normal, as, as we keep hearing. Um, so this means that then you can potentially inform those individuals they can return to work. So what you'll need to take into account of, obviously, is the nature of the work they do in your business and the nature of they, their medical condition. So you're almost kind of redoing your risk assessment if you haven't already based on their condition or conditions specifically. Um, so you're looking at what adjustments might I need to make um, to make sure that there's safe, safe working for these individuals when they come back to the workplace. And a question that we've had, I've had come up with lots of companies already is somebody saying that, well, actually, I'm living with somebody who's shielding or I'm looking after somebody who's shielding. So they don't live with me, but are there because of certain needs that they have? I, I'm looking after them because they can't interact. They can't do their own shopping or washing or, or whatnot. Um, and in those circumstances, um, they can return to work, but what they need to do is they need to make changes in their personal lives to reduce the risk to the person who they are interacting with, who, is, who are shielding. And I think in the beginning, certainly, I was seeing quite a common theme of people saying, well, I'm living with somebody who's shielding, so I've got to act as though I'm shielding. And as my employer, I'm expecting you to um act as though i'm shielding as well and that's not and that's not the case um, and i think obviously some people have, have started to feel a bit anxious about that and we'll, we'll go on to talk about that a little bit a little bit more but it's about kind of um being aware of what the government guidance says about people who live in different houses or people who live in the same house trying to um, portion off parts of the house and you know using the bathroom at different times keeping a distance regular hand washing wearing PPE so they need to go to additional lengths in their own lives to protect that person um, while of course you need to be sensitive to their uh, their anxieties and their needs effectively um, you know they should be able to return back to work and childcare um, and other dependent responsibilities. Um, so you might have somebody, I, mean, we've got, I know lots of, uh, lots of organisations have got so know somebody who's supporting an elder parent with um, Alzheimer's, for example. Um, so with childcare needs, schools are only allowing pupils to return on a reduced basis over the next few weeks. And obviously that's going to end soon, differs across different counties. Um, and in Wales, and, and this means that those with those responsibilities have got restrictions on their ability to work potentially. And to exacerbate this, whereas they might have been able to rely on nursery places or holiday clubs um, or grandparents or aunts and uncles, they, because of the situation we've all been in, they're much more likely to have reduced options or no options at, at the moment. So from the end of July, I've had already some business owners saying to me, well, 
well they you know they well they would have had their children over the summer holidays anyway so what's different now to you know if we weren't in the situation that we're in well like i said there the holiday clubs aren't aren't there might not be there at all um there's less Less places in nurseries because of bubbles and fewer relatives because some relatives will usually take annual leave over the summer holidays to help and if they've been furloughed they might not they might not have that annual leave to take over the summer holidays so um though, though they may be in that situation where they haven't got the options that they would have normally had um, and for people who are caring for people with alzheimer's or people with mobility issues they're, they're quite often been day centres open, a kind of outreach support that again is not currently available for people. So it's just thinking about the practicalities of um, how you can try and balance the needs of the business and the needs of your staff. Um, so, I mean, technically, those with childcare and other dependent responsibilities um, are required to return to work. They're no different to anybody else. But you need to consider that, they, as I say, they may be able, unable to fulfil their contracts because of their care and responsibilities. So the options to them really are to apply for annual leave if they haven't already had annual leave um, or to apply for a period of unpaid leave. So they could do that through dependence leave, which is an entitlement that um, somebody with children has. And they could apply for a, a fixed period to say, they could even say potentially, I need all of the summer holidays because I have absolutely no um, support available. And you're going to have to look then to see whether as a business, you could perhaps bring in somebody temporarily to cover them for that absence or whether because of the role that they do, it would just um, take too much time to train somebody to come in and do that work potentially. Um, I mean, they may, and you might find that this happens, obviously now we're getting towards the end of furlough and you're going to start communicating about when furlough is coming to an end, that people will potentially resign anyway because they can see that they're not going to be able to fulfil their contract. Um, and eventually you might get to a situation whereby if they don't resign, and they, you can't reach an agreement on what's reasonable in terms of them trying to fulfill their contract, you might need to consider dismissing them. Um, but I would say if you do that, to only do it once you're sure that you've done everything you can to try and reach something that works for you and for them. Um, it goes without saying that the current situation is providing lots of people with anxiety about interacting just to do shopping, never mind coming back to work. So being as encouraging and as reassuring as you can in your attempts to get people back to work safely is obviously going to be the best approach. Um, and only if these efforts fail should you take advice whether you need to consider other options, including ending their contracts. Um, and particularly because you need to be careful about um, those who are shielding or those with children could possibly be covered by discrimination legislation. So if that was something that was taken to an employment tribunal, you've always got that potential additional cost where there's um, a discrimination legislation covering people. So in terms of the survey itself, um, the questions uh, I've outlined there are the ones that I find most useful. I think we started out with a slightly longer list, but this one is the one that seems to focus on the main, the main points. So asking questions about whether somebody's got dependent responsibility that might impact on their ability to return to their contracted hours. So that's about trying to look at, can you meet the contract? If they can, uh, if they do have those responsibilities to outline what the responsibilities are, because again, you might want to think about whether that is covered by, for example, dependents leave, um, and how they might impact on their ability to return to their hours. Also helps them to think about you as a business and what they need to do to try to um, satisfy you as to whether they can return or not. Um, and if they do have dependent responsibilities and they don't feel they can return, to outline that. Because I think then that helps you and certainly find it's helped other organisations to say this person's got no intent of coming back they've made that clear they don't feel they can we've got to enter into a you know specific dialogue with them to try and encourage them and work with them where we can to try and find something that works um, 
And again, if there's potentially adjustable hours that they could work to kind of outline those. So again, you might say, well, actually, I could possibly work with that or something like that. Um, and again, try and reaching, hopefully reaching some kind of a compromise. Um, and if they're if they're shielding, again, to let you know so that you can keep on record then, oh, actually, probably they're going to stay on furlough until mid-August, um, but then I'm hopefully we're planning for them to come back after that. Um, and also other ongoing health conditions. If you haven't already asked that of your staff, it's worth checking because some people have got conditions. Asthma was talked about a lot in the beginning. Um, we obviously, we understand a lot more now about coronavirus than we did back in March. Um, but people who are, have concerns about conditions that they've got, but they're not on the shielding list. So you still need to think about whether something that you do in your business, um, you might have to put adjustments in place for those conditions that you hadn't, you weren't potentially aware of because it might not have been relevant previously. Um, and asking them if they've got any questions that you can answer for them. So I think this is the flagging up to them um, that, um, you know, we want to look where you might be anxious and see where we need to reassure you. Get those questions out the way before they come back to work, rather than hitting you day one when they come back with their anxieties or just not turning up because they're just not feeling safe about, about coming back to work. So it's, it's getting those questions out early and hopefully helping you to plan um, ahead over the next couple of months or you know, the next couple of weeks if you're returning imminently. Um, and you need to think about in the letter, and I've covered a little bit of this off in my previous discussion, about confirming that the date that furlough ends or the date that furlough is being reviewed. So it's a reminder to people, especially because some people might have in their minds, oh, I'm just going to stay furloughed until the end end of October, um, reminding them, uh, reassuring them about measures that you've put in place for their safety, you've done a risk assessment. Um, I'm sure that those of you will know if you've got more than 50 staff, you're required to put your risk assessment on your website and have it available for your clients and staff. I don't think that that's really been widely talked about, but that is a requirement. Um, an outline that they'll receive notice or actually give them that notice in the letter. This is the date we're expecting to open. Um, this is when we're thinking you're going to return. And um, we'll come back to you perhaps before that to um, confirm that if you if you haven't got a definite date. Because I know there are still some companies who can't open because they don't know the exact date the government's going to let their businesses or their business type open. Um, and it's an opportunity for reminding people, and it kind of feeds into your risk assessment as well, that if they are experiencing symptoms or someone in their household is experiencing symptoms, then they'll need to self-isolate for seven or 14 days um, and remind them that they need to still report their absence in line with normal absence reporting procedures. So it's just good to cover that off perhaps in a letter with the questions um, to send out to the staff. So that kind of covers off uh, that section and we're going to move over now to looking at making um, contract variations. So making any changes to the contract, um, it's worth looking um, at, it's worth looking at um, to the, the types of contract clauses that we have. So we have express contract clauses, which are the, which are the clauses that are actually written down within the contract. We also have implied contract clauses, and these are ones that often get forgotten about or don't get thought about until they're challenged. And they're things that might have developed through customer practice. So, for example, if you always give your staff every Christmas Eve afternoon off paid, um, and then the business isn't doing very well this year, you're thinking that that might not be the case because you need everybody in, in um, you know, business picking up. It's a busier time of year this year then you might say, actually, we're not going to do that this year. But if you've always done it and you've done it for 12, 15 years, people will see that as an implied part of their contract and something that they get automatically. So if you've never before said, we're not going to do it, then you need to think about that as a, something that could potentially be challenged. And there's all sorts of different things that um, are similar to that. Um, but policies is another area that we quite often say in policies, 
we're, this is not contractual. But actually, if it's always been that policy, has always been that way for, for many, many years, potentially it might be deemed to have become an implied part of the contract. And that's why it's another reason why it's a good reason to kind of review your contracts regularly and put an updated dates on them, because then you, um, sorry, not your contracts, your policy policies because then you can show that um well actually this poli this policy has only been in place for such and such a time um, i mean if it's something that's always been in previous copies of policies it might still catch you out but it just helps to show that you're reviewing those terms and you have the option to change them uh, which is less more likely um, to allow you to show that they're, they're not implied within the contract um, and if um, you have them, then there are also collective agreements with trade unions are also um, parts of the contract. They're quite often contractual. So when can you make a change to the contract? So you can make, um, you, there's something quite often within contracts that allows changes. So you might have a flexibility clause, which you can um, apply. Um, you, there could be when the employee agrees to the change, which is obviously the main um, kind of contract change that you want to be making effectively. Um, when the employee's rep agrees to the change, again, that's usually part of a structured process. You might have a representative's um, employee representative um, that you can agree changes with rather than going to every individual employee um, or forcing a change. Um, so this is when you might have tried to go through a process and it's failed and then you're potentially um, saying, well, actually, it's so critical to us to make that change that we're going to make it anyway. Um, and you would obviously only do that probably with legal advice because it is something that's going to pose a risk of legal action for you. So looking at flexibility clauses, um, because we, there are lots of them in, in contracts, um, they often cover hours that people work or days that people work. Um, at, in Wales, we see a lot of um, seasonal flexible clauses because certain because of the tourist industry, we, we will have certain months of the year that are busier than others. So it might be some flexibility built into the contract to account for that. And again, that's something that people are anticipating. They're expecting that change. Um, rates of pay might be different hourly rates for certain unsociable hours, for example, might be flexibility there or um, a lot, lot, lots of other lots of other kind of variations of that place of work we see quite regularly. This is your normal place of work. But if you've got other sites, you might say, but it's, you might be expected to work here or there. Um, and it's important to think about the clause usually needs to be fairly specific about the circumstances under which you can use it so it, what I come across quite often um, people want to make a contract change is they, they say oh but I've got this clause in the contract that says that I can make any reasonable changes to the contract I want to because it's not specific enough the chances are that flexibility clause is not really going to be not going to stand um, a test and certainly not in an employment tribunal. So it needs to be more specific about the circumstances in which you can actually use it um, and for you to have a, f a process that you follow when you're going to use that clause. So unless it's something like the seasonal clause where everybody knows um, from the end of o October you're going to reduced hours, um, then you're expecting there to be a process and some notice or you might have a shift pattern that gets changed and you get notice of that. You might get six weeks shifts in a, in a row or something like that. Um, so even if you think basically that it's clear to give you the make for you to allow you to make the change um, still think about talking to employees about the change first, this kind of allows you as well to measure the impact um, on the individuals um, and if you're going to be challenged on it, it gives you a good chance to see what those challenges are and think about whether you might want to change your approach slightly in the hope that you can achieve a compromise or an easier way of implementing the change maybe over time um, so it hopefully works for the business and for the employee which would be the what you would want to achieve ideally 
Um, so consulting on changes, and we'll talk about this a little bit more um, in the next section on redundancies as well. Um, this is effectively about, again, looking to get employees agreement to the change if you can. So discussion allows you to demonstrate a more inclusive approach to the proposed changes um, and hopefully reduces or prevents any potential legal action. So if you've got a recognition agreement um, or a collective agreement with a trade union, the first step might be to discuss the changes with the union. And in fact, if you're going to change more than 20 contracts, then you've got a legal obligation anyway to discuss those, um, those changes because potentially they could result in redundancy. Um, so this discussion kind of focuses on the business case for change, um, why the company need to make the change, um, what they'll need to achieve through making the change. And it is a two-way process, um, as you can see on the slide, explaining the reasons for the change, inviting the conversation, listening to concerns and considering ideas. And actually, when we come to pitfalls, I think this is something that um, employers don't always do. They don't always go into the process um, thinking that they might have a different, slightly different outcome. And sometimes in tribunal cases, that's what you will see. People will people will fall down. They've got this fixed idea about what the outcome will be, and this needs to be you need to be able to demonstrate a two way dialogue, um, doing everything you can effectively to resolve concerns that employees have, um, and. Employees have also got the responsibilities in this, of course, and it's always useful to highlight this to them. Um, consider the changes, consider the reasons for the change, make sure that they share their views, they don't just sit there and not agree with them, and then later on in the process, when you've already passed the point of talking, then start raising those concerns, um, and make sure that they've tried all options to reach an agreement. And then you're going to be looking to put the agreement of changes in writing. So this might be another contract, but it doesn't have to be. It could just be a letter confirming what those changes are that you then preferably get the employee to sign, um, but it doesn't have to be as long as it's part of another documented process. So these are the things that you need to get in writing if you're changing them. Um, and I've put a little be aware there on the bottom because some of you may already know, but in April, this year, something called the Good Work Plan came into effect, which means that any new contracts sent out after April need to include additional information. So if you haven't updated your contracts already in line with the Good Work Plan, go to the ACAS website because they've got some really good details on what you do need to have in your contracts if you haven't already updated them. So even though really they're designed for new people, if you're sending out updated contracts, those ones also need to include the new information in them. And we get to the if changes can't be agreed section. So it's about um, keep talking, keep going over the concerns, trying to reach a compromise. And again, as much as you can document your attempt to do that, if you were to end up in a tribunal at some point at the end of all of this, um, then you've got that documentation that will potentially mitigate um, to show that you were attempting to try and keep the dialogue going, keep um, hopefully to reach a compromise. Um, consider, make sure, like I said, you consider what the options are. Document why they wouldn't work, um, because again, this is potentially something that's going to be challenged later on. And you might not remember, why didn't we agree to that? I can't quite remember what the discussion was at the time. Um, make sure you follow policies. So if it looks like a member of staff is challenging to the extent where actually they might be raising a grievance, talk to them about whether they have got a grievance, get that out of the way, deal with it, rather than potentially having to deal with a grievance much later on when things have already broken down. Um, consider if the changes are absolutely necessary, can they be revised? Could you get a similar outcome? Might not be what you were really looking for, but something that is again a compromise that you might have less challenge over, might be easier to implement. Um, and if all else fails, and the, cha the changes that you need to implement are absolutely necessary, then you, then you do need, unfortunately, to consider dismissing the employee and offering them a new contract under the new terms. So, of course, this should only be done with legal advice um, to make sure that you have done everything else that you could have done to try to achieve the change 
um, and make sure that you are documenting that you followed a fair process. So moving on to the specifics of consulting on proposed redundancies, um, the biggest pitfall I'm going to start with or um, right at the beginning is that lots of employers don't consider that actually people are very aware of their rights these days. Um, I think I go back 10, 15 years ago when I started doing redundancies and people, it was almost a fait accompli. People were, oh, mostly, okay, I've been selected, that's that. Um, now they don't, they challenge every single step of the way. So when you put together your process, don't make assumptions that this is going to be an easy ride. Make assumptions you are going to be tested at each stage. So make sure that each stage is robust enough to stand up to that test. Um, and, you know, we, we've, we do a lot more employee engagement now than we did probably 10, 15 years ago. So people are more mindful as well that their colleagues are, in, are, are treated with respect, that their colleagues are seen to be treated fairly. So again, even if people aren't at risk of redundancies, but their colleagues are, um, you will get a lot more impact on um, individual, from individuals who will you know, kind of rally in, in their colleagues' defence. So don't underestimate that, the impact of that either. We're going to move to employee wellbeing in the last section, but again, being mindful and sensitive to the mental health impact of the consultation exercise is, is, is essential as well. Um, so you need to make sure that you um, are ticking the box to say, actually, I'm quite clear that this is definitely a redundancy. Um, there's the work itself is ceasing or reducing or the business is closing in a particular a particular site or the whole entire business is closing down. And that's the, the main definitions of redundancy that you will need to start with. Um, so you need to be confident that that is the case. You also need to remember that redundancy is a dismissal and then Therefore, um, that's the case. Even if the employee applies for voluntary redundancy, it's still technically classed as a dismissal. Um, and the second pitfall, again, which I come across often, is um, if, the if the situation isn't actually redundancy, it's actually misconduct, but we think it's easier rather than dealing with the misconduct or the poor performance, because that can be a long process, um, to just say, actually, we're just going to make people redundant. Um, because if the evidence isn't there to show that it's a real redundancy, then potentially that's going to let you down and the redundancy then might be seen to be unfair. So the first one of the other things you need to do at the beginning is look at demonstrating how you can avoid compulsory redundancies. So this is a process, um, again, I flagged up a pitfall at the beginning, that's about roles and not about people. Really important not to say um, Jackie Jones is um, on the list to be made redundant. It's the finance assistant is on the list to be made redundant. Um, don't have a list of individuals who are at risk. Um, have a list of roles that are at risk because you need to, and it does actually help to depersonalize it if you're talking about roles. And sometimes it helps people to understand because people will take it personally um, if you make them redundant. It's not about the fact that they're not doing their job well. Um, it's a fact about the fact that the business needs can no longer sustain the need for this role because the business has changed or because the profit's not what it was um, and make it try to depersonalize it as much as possible while still being sensitive, of course, to the fact that people are going to feel it personally. Um, so as long as you can demonstrate you've considered alternatives before you look to make redundancies, then you should be able to um, demonstrate, you, you should document it. Um, and so considering, for example, um, people applying for voluntary redundancy and restricting employment to vacancies and redeploying staff at risk of redundancy to those roles. So either using natural wastage when people go, don't replace them, and you know profits are starting to fall, um, or looking, actually, we've got another job, we could potentially train somebody to move into rather than making them redundant. So think about those first. Um, and I'm, they're, they're bound to come up within the process anyway if people are aware of them. Another couple of pitfalls for you are um, when you're looking at voluntary redundancy, make sure you reserve the right not to accept it. You might get, and I've had this lots of times, um, pe more people applying than you want to apply. And then you've got to have set criteria to show why you've chosen some over others. 
Um, and sometimes they're, they're a lot harder to be objective about because it might be your person who's brilliant, who's your go-to person, who you definitely don't want to lose. But actually, in a score, in a, in a measuring sense, it's really hard sometimes to define that. So um, you just need to be careful about that and make sure that you do reserve the right to say no. Um, and making sure, pitfall number five, making sure that you have established that a vacant the redundancy actually exists. Because otherwise, if you're asking for volunteers before you've even agreed a redundancy exists, you could end up um, see, um, with a claim for a failure to consult on the potential redundancies. Um, it's a bit of an unfair one, that one, um, because you're trying to make sure the process is um, as effective and at least impact for everyone, and potentially you could end up being at risk. So just be careful of that. Looking then um, at when you, you do get into a situation where compulsory redundancies, you need to identify which employees will be made redundant, so which roles, um, and that again is going to come back to your business case. I'm going to go on to the business case in a, little, in a couple of slides. Um, and looking at making sure that you do select people fairly. So it's quite common for people to say there's a fixed term contract coming to an end, uh, a fixed term contract um, running, I'm going to bring that one to an end. I've got part time member of staff, actually, if I just lose them, then I can continue. You can't just target necessarily your part time person. There's got to be a more objective process than that. Um, and potential pitfall number six, make sure you get the at-risk roles right. So there isn't just the roles immediately obvious. So somebody's an admin or somebody's a manager and you automatically just, you've targeted that person because you can see that that team need to make a reduction. You have to look across the company where there may be interchangeable roles and consider whether they might need to be put in a pool. One of those people might need to go. I mean, it could be that there's a technical aspect to their job that's quite specific, but they've just got the title of manager. But just think about that across the company, not just thinking it's obvious to me that this person, this, this role um, needs to go. And then looking at your, um, remembering your fair reasons for um, selection. So it's usual to draw up a scoring mechanism, which might be a matrix, or sometimes it's, um, it's an interview, but where you can basically score people against these criteria. And again, looking at um, the pitfalls, one of the things that I see quite often is people actually fail to consult on those criteria to make sure that you're putting that as part of your process to say these are the criteria that we're going to score you against so that employees have got a chance to test the objectivity of them. And um, as we've already said, looking at, looking at periods of attendance, it's quite common. People know this now, um, you know, don't include attendance with maternity periods and potentially not for disability related absences because potentially your selection criteria are going to be seen to be discriminatory. Um, moving on to consultation itself, we've talked a little bit about consultation already, um, but if you don't consult then any redundancies will almost certainly be unfair. Um, you must follow collective consultation rules if you're making 20 or more employees redundant. Um, and there's no set rules to follow for less than 20, but still there's an expectation that you're going to at least follow the overall framework in your consultation process. Um, and there might be a decision you've dismissed unfairly if you don't. Looking at pitfall number nine, this is something lots of companies don't have to come across. But if you do make more than 20 employees redundant, you need to know that you've got to set, you've got to issue a section 188 notice either to a trade union or to your represent, employee representative. And you've got to submit a HR1 form to the Secretary, um, Secretary of State. Um, I'm not going to say too much about those because they're very specific to that, to that situation. Um, and as I've already said, don't seek to predict the outcome. If you write your consultation process as a done deal, people will see it as a done deal and you won't be, you won't be showing that transparency and it won't be seen to be meaningful consultation. So always use the language of these are proposals, no decisions have been made until we've had the consultation, we've been through the consultation process because those are the sorts of things that people trip up on, um, just the language of trying to make it look like a fair process. 
Um, and just looking at the business case, and again, I covered this in the last webinar, but just to make sure that you're looking at the business case, the things that need to be, you do need to tick off. If you're in a collective consultation, these are all the things that will go into your 188 notice anyway, um, because they're all the things that you need to consult on. Um, so this is about demonstrating a fair process, giving employees um, a good chance to understand the business case, giving them as much information as possible. So hopefully they can understand the reasons for the change um, and then give them time to think about the proposals and respond to them before you make any final decisions on the actual um, changes to be made. I'm not going to go through the list there. Um, but employees who are at risk of redundancy, as well as doing um, consultation with trade unions, they need to be met with on an individual basis if their role is at risk. Um, and that, again, you'll go through the process then of talking through the business case again. It's usual for at least two meetings of this nature to take place before you make a final decision um, as to who will be made redundant or the, the other roles that are definitely redundant. Um, and then once you've had the final meeting to tell the um, to you'll make a decision and then the employee will, will can potentially have an appeal um, and an appeal isn't a right um, in a redundancy process it's not like a usual dismissal but because it's a dismissal um, having an appeal is actually really useful for you because you get to understand what their argument might be at a tribunal and you get a chance to rectify that potentially um, but also because it is a dismissal, the tribunal may decide that had you have had an appeal that you, you might have overturned the decision. Um, so, you, so it's always good pra best practice really to have an appeal. Um, and it's the same thing with um, being accompanied. So um, there's no right to be accompanied in redundancy meetings, but because the final meeting is quite often seen as the dismissal meeting, it's best practice to allow um, somebody to be accompanied in that meeting because again it's just showing that you're being fair and transparent and um, in supporting the employee and um, so moving on to another couple of pitfalls um, if you've got somebody on sick leave or parental leave maternity leave quite often is one actually where people completely forget people on maternity leave and i'll suddenly get um, somebody saying to me oh what about barbara and um, we haven't spoken to barbara and we're halfway through the process and i'm thinking who's barbara nobody's mentioned barbara to me oh she's on maternity leave she's not back till next year um but so even though her post may not be affected um as in you're not intending to make her redundant you still got to consult with um with individuals who are on maternity leave who are sick and you might need to make adjustments to the process so you might need to meet with them separately rather than in the group meetings that you might be having otherwise um, and also think about the special protection for employees on maternity leave to be offered any suitable alternative employment before anybody else. Um, so that doesn't mean that you can't make um, people who return on maternity from maternity redundant, but they do have the right to be offered a suitable alternative employment first. Um, Okay. And then looking at your selection process, just a little bit more. Um, so once you've kind of been through, you've confirmed, uh, you've gone through the consultation, um, then you look at the scoring mechanism. And as I said, you'll look at measuring the pool of staff against the select selection criteria that you've already outlined, either through a matrix or an interview process. Um, this again is about documenting, showing transparency, demonstrating a fair process. And this is, again, another big pitfall that I find is that organisations don't spend enough time behind the scenes actually saying to staff, this is what you need to demonstrate to score a five, for example, this is what you need to demonstrate to score a 10, um, because people might write something, but they don't know what everybody else is writing. They've got to have an idea about what they're aiming for. Um, and again, I see that happening all the time. And then um, once the selection process is ended, obviously those who are made redundant will be formally notified of their redundancy, giving them details of um, the estimate of their pay, their notice, and um, confirming their last day of employment, the right of appeal. So there's a letter, you've got to tick a few 
boxes um, in the notice letter that, that goes out. And this is assuming that you haven't got alternative roles for them to look at, because that's another a separate process that you need to look at if you've got staff that are redundant and you've potentially got a suitable alternative role for them. I'm not going to go through that in detail because it, it is specific to, to that situation. So moving on just to the last um, part of the webinar this morning, thinking about staff wellbeing, I'm sure we're all very aware um, at the moment, um, but I don't expect any of us have survived through the period it would have some impact on mental health and well-being for me personally it was being locked down with two seven-year-olds and efforts at homeschooling um, and I think I struggled most when we were only allowed to exercise once a day because I couldn't walk my dogs or me um, and escape the house more than once a day so um, I think even those who've loved maybe not having to travel to work or being busy with work will have experienced some anxiety about what the future brings what the new normal looked like um, so if you want your staff to perform at their best, you need to think about their well-being. If you're making changes to contracts or redundancies, you need to even be more aware of the impact. You might be aware of the MIND initiative, Time for Change. Um, so employees can effectively sign up to, um, to it be an employer who's aware and who has an environment and um, where people can talk about mental health at work so um, check that out that's a really um, easy one actually even if you just have posters up to signpost people to some of these initiatives because you're not directly interacting with them all the time um, it, you know having uh, maybe for example a mental first uh, mental first aid um, people trained within your teams is kind of a bigger organization but just having somewhere that people People can look when they're on the breaks at the poster and know that there's somewhere to go, know that they've got a supportive environment, um, then that those things in themselves can be, be really useful. Um, and just a little um, plan of action for you following the webinar. Obviously, these things may or may not be directly relevant, but just looking to furlough the look at review the furlough arrangements that um, what's left over the from now to October. Uh, look to write out to your staff, surveying them, uh, and think about whether you do need to make changes to employment contracts and how you can do that safely. Um, think about if you do need to commence with restructuring, working your timetable back to see how soon you might need to start that based on your staff's um, length of service, best, um, based on the consultation period and whatnot. Um, and consider your own um, and your staff's well-being, looking at implementing a culture of encouraging open conversations about mental health in the workplace. Um, and as I said, if, if you do feel you need any um, additional support, you can obviously go back to your relationship managers and they can, they can share contact details with you you signpost you um, but if you wanted to if you feel you need something more specific I say I have got some um, half an hour slots available my excuse me my email address is leslie at lansker.co.uk um, and just a couple of little slides as one which is again if you feel you imminently need to restructure uh, you, you need something really quick um, someone to come in and assist um, then AGP have got restructuring professionals that can help with that, but go to your relationship manager if that's something you think you need. Um, and just a reminder, as Lisa said, about making sure you send back those forms. Um, so I think I've run over a little bit on time, apologies. Um, didn't talk as fast as maybe I did when I rehearsed the webinar. <laughs> so I'm going to switch my video back on now and give you an opportunity to ask questions. But I'll just say... Um, thank you very much. I'm sure you've um, heard enough of my voice for the morning. And uh, thank you very much, um, everybody. I'll try and switch my camera back on. Thanks, Leslie. Lots of uh, information to process in there. Yeah. I know some may have to shoot off, but if anyone wants to come off mic and ask Leslie any questions, I know lots was covered in there. So um, if anyone does, now's your chance. And again, obviously, you've got, you've got my email address. If there's a couple of questions you don't want to ask uh, on the webinar, by all means, drop me an email and uh, I'm sure I can help with a couple of couple of questions there. Oh, I think you're uh, you get a coffee break now, Leslie, by the look. Okay, there was lots obviously covered in that one there. Yeah, hopefully. That's, yeah. 
that's the aim, isn't it? We could cover it all off in the webinar. We might not have but You don't have to answer any questions at the end. Yes. Job well done there, we are. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, most, are, most are disappearing now anyway. So uh, thanks for that presentation, Leslie, and giving up your time. And thank you to everyone, obviously, for giving up your time to pop on here. Hope you all have a, um, a good rest of the day. So thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>